What's up, y'all? Back at it once again. It's a Koski of Fun Day. And um, we're gonna finish up, we're starting to finish up the um the Negro immigration movement. You know, I show all parts of the conference, Martin Delaney, Alexander Cromwell, um, um Henry Highland Garnett. Now I'm gonna show the overall function of this, you know, the Negro immigration movement, a phase of Negro nationalism. You know. It's something I be talking about because you know people talk about black nationals now, but don't go back to the, the progenitors of the thought during the Mayafa. If you don't know what the Mayafa is, the Mayafa is when um a low time during African history with the slave trade and things of that nature. So they really don't show that that much, you know what I mean? So we're gonna talk about it right here. Negro immigration movement, 1849 to 1854. A phase in Negro nationalism. During the first half, let me hold on before I get into this. Let me show this by Howard Bell. And I got this from, you know, almost I'll get through, I get some JS Thor. So, you know, it's peer review research. You know what I'm saying? So, you have the stuff, all the stuff in here on this is peer review research. <clears throat> During the first half of the 19th century, many Negroes in the United States have become increasingly discontent with their lot. Although many channels and endeavor to provide individual expression, which they lack, but also achieving full citizenship within a nation. As these goals continue to be unattainable, Negro leaders begin to think more and more in terms of self-government. If protest and petition in Negro and political affiliation prove whites ineffective, they must seek fulfillment through the development of a unity based upon mutual interests. The hopes of the Negro had been raised by the Free Soul Party movement in 1848, only to be dashed by the enactment of a stringent fugitive slave law of 1850. Increasingly, prospective laws were being enacted in the South, while Negroes were becoming less welcome in the North. All right, we don't have to talk about that. We have to show some videos because you know people trying to say the North was better. No, it was all the same. The North just hit their slavery a little bit more better with laws. Where then might the Negro turn? Some sort of answer in the kind of, of racial self-government within the United States. Others, wary of the struggle for equality in America, saw the answer in migration in the formation of a new nation where the Negro could be a sovereign. <clears throat> this emphasis on migration and Negro sovereignty can best be described as a kind of Negro nationalism in that the nationalism was one of the dominant forces affecting the, the free Negroes in the decade before the Civil War. The idea of migration was not new to the Negro community. They had practiced it intermittently for 30 years, but Negro leaders had not been consistent in their attitude towards the practice. Generally, the conservatives and established leaders opposed it. By 1845, however, a change was becoming apparent in the Negro attitude towards migration. And after the date, sons of prominent anti colonialist leaders were found temporarily at least seeking their fortune in Liberia or Haiti or the British West Islands or California. Visiting Liberia in 1846, William C. Conus, son of Samuel E. Conus, minimized the disadvantage of climate and spoke highly of the government there. Two years later, Robert Douglas, son of prominent Philadelphia minister, was in Jamaica but found it economically expedient to stay long. George B. Fashan, the son of John B. Fashan of Pittsburgh, spent over two years in Haiti as a youth, and memory experience with some degree of nostalgia many years later. In 1847, the National Negro Convention at Troy, New York, was ready to listen respectfully to a plan for a commercial venture involving Negroes of Jamaica, the United States, and Africa. The proposition called for the development of a company owned and operated by the people of African descent. It exchanges its own products through the triangle trade from Jamaica to the United States to Africa. This has yet to be done. Remember, this is 1847. This has never, this is, you no. Know, every time we try to come up with this sort of trade thing from the Caribbean to Africa to the United States, something always happens. Remember, this is where the idea first really got ground roots in 1847. He might say Paul Cuffey too. This proposition called for the development or where did. This is the practical interest in the ideas closely related to the immigration is noteworthy. 
because here for the first time, a National Assembly of Negro Leaders held for grades in consideration to an African project. In the following months, there is evidence of growing interest in migration. By August 1848, A.M. Sumner of Ohio was seeking passage to Africa. He believed a sizable minority of American Negroes were seriously considering migration, but he was not convinced that Africa was the place to go. He attended publishing the truth about what he found, shall I live to return. In September the same year, S.S. Ball, representing Illinois Negroes, returns from Liberia, and he seemed to have been favorably impressed with what he found there. Delegations returning from Africa were also reported for the states of Ohio and Kentucky. This new interest in Africa was influenced in part by the Libertarian Declaration of Independence, Liberian Declaration of Independence, 1847. A Negro nation had thereby replaced a suspect American colonial society as a chief authority in an Anglo-African settlement. Thenceforth, Liberia, like Haiti and Canada, was considered worthy of respect of the American Negroes. It should not be assumed that the Liberian independents were responsible for new ideas concerning migration. The birth of the Republic fitted into and encouraged a trend that was already well on the way. Up to this time, a few outstanding Negro leaders had favored migration, but for the next 15 years, there was no dearth champion of this cause. Of these many new champions were Henry Highland Garnett, educated at the Ontario Institute and advocate for political action as opposed to dependence upon moral persuasion. Garnett had also devoted most of his efforts during the 1840s in promoting the Liberty Party and battling down strongholds of the slave aristocracy. Immigration to him had been strictly taboo, but by January 1849, he was publicly recognized immigration as a legitimate means of wealth and power. He was even willing to accept the work at the American Christian Colonization Society, insofar as it benefited Africa. A few weeks later, he was urged that those dubious advancement of America to immigrate. He supported no particular area, California, Mexico, Central America, and Liberia were all satisfactory. Martin Delaney, editor of The Mystery during the 1840s, had been an anti colonizationist in sympathy, but by 1849, he too was glad to see an independent Negro nation in Africa. As of late in 1851, however, Delaney was still clinging to the belief that the American Negro should not be lured away to such lands beyond the bounds of the United States, not even to Canada. But in the spring of 1852, he had come forth with a fully developed plan for a color empire in the Caribbean Sea area. But Martin Delaney had a plan for a Negro empire in the Caribbean area. And for a decade or more after, he devoted his chief efforts to encouraging Negro migration and Negro nationalism, which in his estimates went hand in hand. It was not until he turned away his immigration screens for an officer uniform in the Union Army that he was once once reconciled, temporarily at least, to living in the land of his birth. Meantime, he, like Garnett, had spent some of those years as a migrant. Two other men had been active in the Liberty Party circles during the 1840s, transferred their activities to foreign soil in 1851. Unlike Garnett and Delaney, however, they did not return to the United States for any significant length of time. Samuel R. Ward, editor of the National Watchman, and later the impartial citizen, immigrated to Canada, where he established a third newspaper, the Provincial Freeman. Later in the decade, he moved to Jamaica, where he died shortly before the opening of the American Civil War. Henry Beebe, poorly educated, but a man of ability and commanding and bearing, proceeded to war to Canada, and by a few months established the Voices of the Fugitive, which he edited in time of his death in 1854. War and Beebe were fugitive slaves, and the Fugitive Slaves Law of 1850 had been credited with driving them beyond the borders of the United States. But the law was not wholly responsible since the rapidly growing Negro settlements in Canada were challenging to men accustomed to making a life by the pen and voice. Opportunity beckoned also from England, where once upon a time, the early 1850s, the roster of American Negro leaders include Garnett, Alexander Cromwell, J. W. C. Pennington, William Wells Brown, and Ellen and William Kraft. Oppositely, 
They were there for purely anti-slavery purposes to avoid the fugitive slave law. In most cases, however, their retreat to Europe was socially and financially remunerative. As a period of special recognition for the Negro speakers drew into a close in America, England was anxious to hear what they had to say. They welcomed a court there with growing difficulty with Negro leaders and securing satisfactory appointments in America was not conducted to, keep in, in, to keep the able, ambitious speakers at home. And while Negro leaders lived back on British soil, the average American Negro was not affected by the newest interest in distant places. California, long considered by Garrisonians and ambitionists, and made by many Negroes to be as undesirable for immigration as any other reason, was reported by 1855 to be the home of nearly 5,000 Negroes. A Cincinnati meeting under the chairmanship of E.P. Walker went on record of favoring immigration to Africa. Newspaper reported the lectures of S.S. Ball at Springfield, Illinois, and St. Louis, Missouri to also be favorable. Meantime, a city and a county invention at Philadelphia recorded a favorable opinion of the colonization of the Victoria, Queen Victoria's dominions. With this manifest interest in migration, the old line leaders were higher press in their efforts to hold the Negro communities steady. Frederick Douglass, chief spokesman for the stay at home, noted that an upsurge of feeling in the favor of migration, but countered it with nothing more than traditional protests, which have been voiced for many years. In a private communication, however, he, Frederick Douglass, stated, I really fear that some of those whose presence in this country is necessary to elevation of the color people will leave us, while the degraded and worthless remain behind to help bind us to our present debasement. It was inevitable that the renewed interest in immigration should be reflected in the state and national assemblies. Those interests in preventing the status quo in New York were challenged more on one occasion by Lewis H. Putman, who was accused of working with the American Colonization Society in an attempt to persuade free Negroes to accept exploration to Africa. By the autumn of 1851, he and his colleagues seemed to have been responsible for an organization known as United African Republic Immigration Society. On October 6, 1851, Putman was announced at a public meeting in New York and reported on migration to Liberia was refusing the hearing but the immigration was not to be deterred. By championing Negro nationalism, they saw also discredit those who wished to keep the Negro in America. They charged that the stay-at-home opposition for migration was purposeful for keeping churches, four churches, and schoolhouses, and plenty of patients and waiters and other assistants. To accomplish this end, the ministers and teachers and doctors and restaurants in the eyes of immigration will misrepresent the facts about the advantages to be gained by leaving the United States. Within a few months, Whitman was accused of having gained favor of Governor Washington E. Hunt here with a plea that the state funds be diverted to his colonization scheme. This move and the government's favorable comment in his annual message created consternation among Negro leaders bent on staying in America. On the morning that the governor's message was made public, the Committee of 13, a kind of Negro, land, Negro vigilante organization representing New York and Brooklyn, issued a call for a state convention to meet in Albany, January 20th, 1852. They also called a metropolitan area meeting for January 13th, which when assembled, listened to the address of John J. Zhu, James McClune Smith, Samuel E. Cornish, and George Downing. These men represented the teaching, medical, menstrual, business professions, respectively were outstanding example of the very class that Putman and his associates had accused of seeking to thwart the interests of the Negro of the nation in order to safeguard their own positions of leadership. Hmm. The state convention was called on short, short notice for January 20th, 1852. Consists largely of a New York delegation. They were received by the Governor Hunt, who accepted their address in a friendly manner. He was reported to have favorably impressed upon their arguments that the Negroes did not wish to leave their brethren in bondage and that the colonial scheme was a fraud. But the committee of 13 did not stop with the appeal to the governor. The people of the state, they issued an education and propagandistic address, propagandistic address, replete with statistical data. 
they start to correct the alleged misconceptions and accomplishment and the ambitions of the Negro. Despite the efforts of the Committee of 13, Putman and his new immigration society secured the funds, probably through an agreement with some established colonial society, colonization societies. It sent out an agent, one Abraham Caldwell, who wrote euphemistically about colorful reports within the promises of houses, farming tools to the settlers who will come to Liberia. Send me access, and I will cause the wilderness of Bible for them, and the deserts to bloom as the rose, and the sons and daughters of Africa to shout. Caldwell's second report indicated that nine houses are already awaiting occupants, and the legend that two hours of labor per day will be fruitful as a work of day in the whole United States. A Putman found few who cared to accept the invitation. By 1853, he was again trying to persuade other states to send their Negro population to Africa. In doing so, he ran afoul of the biting pen of James McClune Smith, who contended Putman God was his belly and therefore was stupid any level to satisfy it. He bowed down to for a rag guy with an Oriental obstinacy, he encountered, canonizing it that it will minister to the organ. Smith insists that Putman could only enjoy the ill gotten fruits of his labor, even while listening to the protests of free Negroes being deprived of their homes because of his imaginations. While Putman held the center stage in New York, Maryland, New York, Maryland Negroes in, 18, in July 1852 were examining the problem of migration in the state convention of Baltimore. Some residents of Baltimore felt that the convention delegates had been selected in such a way the decision reach will not only affect the opinion of colored people in Germany, but the only group already looking to Africa. Under these circumstances, certain Baltimore Negroes set out to intimidate the delegation. Although police protection was provided, some violence ensued. In fact, pressure on the convention came so great that several representatives dropped out on the second day, and by the third day, even the president was indisposed and had to be replaced. The chief problem before the Baltimore, before the Maryland Convention was that of immigration, and it represented the colonialist press and the trend towards Liberia. This bent toward Liberia, if it did exist, was materially modified before the convention was over. In the end, the assembly stood proud for migration, stood for immigration, with some represents for Liberia, but with provisions for investigation of and the education on other civil localities. Furthermore, it was held that the pending migration of the time should not be wasted, but should be utilized in securing better training and education at home. In Ohio, where the Negroes more likely to consider immigration to Canada or the Caribbean Sea area, the forces of migration in the Negro, that's kind of crazy, they try to fight them. That's kind of crazy, y'all. I'm just kind of, kind of baffled by that part that the majority of the people want to go home, but the, the, the so-called people that had the shops and all that stuff, you know, the bourgeoisie didn't want to stay. Kind of same stuff we going through now. I'll just get back to this. Negro nationalism was strong enough by 1849 to command extensive consideration in the state convention at Columbus. An attempt to condemn migration in a traditional manner was answered by David Jenkins, who looked forward in the eventual migration of all colored people. He was ably supported by John Merson Langston, young, well-educated, and later become active in Republican circles, who held that he loved his freedom more than his country, and that he'd be happy to see the migration of Negroes and establishment of a Negro nation. Eventually, the matter was entrusted to the committee comprised of Langston, W.H. Burnham, and J.L. Watson of Cleveland. Langston and Burnham agreed on a solution, calling for the Negro to remain in the United States until the slaves were free, and then that pleasure to withdraw from the country and form a separate nation. But Watson, once a slave, held fast to the tradition standing against migration for any reason. His minority report was approved by the majority of the convention. Three years later, 1852, Negroes managed state convention in Cincinnati and once more grappled with the problem. Again, a majority of the committee on immigration recommended leaving the country. And again, a minority report presented the opposite view. John M. Langston, still an art advocate of immigration, spoke to the natural repetency between the races and paradoxically. 
for the fear of loss of identifying with it if the Negroes remain in the United States. But able speech by Langston and others were not enough to swing the convention in favor for migration. The migration lost by a ratio of four to one ratio. This decision has been reasonably representative by the Negro opinion of Ohio. For only a year later, Frederick Douglass, perhaps the most influential anti-immigrationist leader of the time, estimated that one out of four Ohio favored migration. The Convention of 1852 was well received in Cincinnati, with at least two of the local papers agreeing the emphasis of migration as well placed. But the report in one of the Cleveland papers, probably William William by William Howard Day. We got a video on this man. This man is very important. One of the very important men in, the, in history we don't get talked about. William Howard Day, who had yet to embrace the cause, sought to minimize the importance even to the subject of the convention floor. By 1852, however, it was impossible to disregard the issue so much in the Negro mind. As late as October and November, there were still repercussions in the abolitionist press on the Ohio State Convention that, led, that held at Cincinnati in January. Meantime, Canada had gone to be the haven in the refuge for many slaves fleeing from bondage for free Negroes had grown worry of their second class citizen in the United States. Negroes of Trenton, New Jersey, held a series of meetings in 1851 with the view to purchase land in Canada for settlement purposes. Maryland Negroes had long been interested in Canada. And there had been a report of one brief period settlers had arrived in Canada from Ohio, Vermont, Pennsylvania, and the District of Columbia. Henry Bibby, voicing a common opinion on the advantages of migration, stated that it is useless. Therefore, for such a leading color man in the state that I look upon for advice to resist the current feeling which prompted so many to seek better their condition. Bibby himself was serving a cause of migration effectively through the volume columns of his newspaper, and not only a few months of establishing the voice of the fugitive, he was creating a call for the North American Convention to meet in Toronto, mm. including the call of an invitation of Negroes to the United States to come to Canada. When, when assembled on September 9th, 1851, the Toronto Convention considered a plan presented by James T. Hawley of Vermont, later prominent in the Haitian migration movement, immigration movement. Hawley plan invests a North America and a Western Indian Federal Agricultural Union with the provisions of cooperative purchases and distributed land in areas listed in the cash title. Thus, the land acquired could be sold on easy terms for cash as needed for the individual settler might dictate. A second Canadian convention, which was held at Amsterdam in 1853, also invited the United States Negroes to cross the border to the land of freedom. They held that the American Negro owed no loyalty to the United States and that migration did not take place, revolution would. That if Canada was not an acceptable haven for them, then Haiti beckoned. By this time, 1853, a climax was approaching. Migration is feeling that it had been pronounced since 1849 and was motivated variously by a desire for an economic opportunity and for the venture for, uh, for personal safety or for a social advantage. Whatever the explicit motive, the feeling was often accompanied by a strong desire to be rid of second class citizenship. And almost as often as accompanied by the kind of Negro nationalism which refused to set plans presented by whites for migration and colonization of Negro. But encouraged pl in plans for the immigration, establishing new homes, and perhaps a new government under Negro leadership. Under these circumstances, those leaders were anxious to keep the Negro community stably faced, stable based on strong opposition. They were influenced moreover by the same abuses which led their opponents to seek relief in migration. They saw the same fulfillment and desire for the recognition of self-expression. They felt the same stirrings of Negro nationalism, but they offered a different solution. Meeting at a national enclave at Rochester, New York, and merely following the Canadian Convention of 1853, these established leaders in the Negro society made plans to send up a Negro National Council with, super, with, with supertory authority over a Negro National College, a Negro National Arbitration Committee, and a Negro National Consumers Union, a Negro National Trade and Labor Office, and a Negro National Library and Propaganda Headquarters. 
National organization on the home front from food and supply to propaganda and from education to semi-judicial decisions was the answer to traditional leaders to challenges of immigrationists. Now let me pause this right quick. We don't think nothing, we don't even think that big no more. You know, I'm into a couple of groups you know, around my local area and, and on the internet and stuff like that. So we we're not thinking big like this, y'all. You know what I'm saying? This is the big difference between how it was going, you know what I'm saying, back then from the nationalism back then to the nationalism now. You know what I'm saying? We know we're near on this level now. Y'all feel me? Nowhere near the thinking. Let's get back to this. In an effort to keep the Negro community stable, they had themselves resorted to a kind of Negro nationalism. They had created one of their opponents described as an informal national organization of the more of the denation of people, whereby organic through premature and sickly birth was given to the idea of national independence. Migrationists monetarily checked by the action of the stay at homes were quickly to regain the initiative. They issued a call for a national immigration convention to be in Cleveland, Ohio, August 18454. Those opposed to the migration of the United States were not invited. Even supporters of the American Colonial Society with emphasis on Africa were warned they should not be welcomed. The convention was to be devoted solely on development plans for migrating to Canada, the West Indies, or Central Americas. Very close enough to encourage runaway slaves to seek safety in their midst. But a presentation of migration is more distant places must be postponed. The single largest delegate, the largest single delegation came from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Michigan and Ohio was well represented and have a dozen other states, as well as Canada, also send delegations. Officers of the convention include William C. Moore, president and several vice presidents among them, the Right Reverend William Paul Quinn, and Mrs. Mary Bibby, wife of Henry Bibby, received and passed. Martin the lady head of the Strategic Business Committee. This assembly had been called with understanding that those opposed to migration would not, have a, would not have a hearing. However, J. M. Langston, no longer an advocate of migration, was invited to speak. In lengthy and rhetorical speech, repeated with classical elegance, he said his opposition. Such defection cannot be tolerated. H. F. Douglas replied with his scathing criticism. He accused Langston of inconsistency. He challenged immigration and he held the Negro nation and he held for Negro nationalism. He maintained that migration was interested, not in an individual, but in the group. That Langston and his kind was selfish was staying at home. He denounced his American own American citizenship and stated that he would gladly fight against the nation in order to secure the future of the race. The public scorn which had been heaped upon the Negro immigrations in the 1930s I came full circle in the National Immigration Conference of 1854. The philosophy of the immigration was embodied in length in the report. The, destiny, the political destiny of the colored race, read by Martin Delaney and accepted by the convention, he denied, it's denied both the citizenship and the freedom of the Negro people, of the American Negro, and contended that freedom existed only where a racial group consisted of a majority. It approved migration to the Caribbean via area via Canada as a way station. And it warned that rights withheld by the majority were never freely given, but must be seized. On the other hand, migrations were far from being convinced they would have to deal forever with white supremacy. The white race are only one third of the population of the globe. One of them for two of us. It cannot be continued much longer. The two-thirds will passively submit to universal domination of this one-third. The convention approved of Martin Delaney's plan, first published in 1852, where it called for temporary migration to the Canada en route to the Caribbean and a Negro empire, or rather an empire of colored peoples in a tropical area of the Western Hemisphere. They were well satisfied with what they had started. They claimed credit for being the first colored organization in the nation develop a satisfactory plan for the uplift of the race. They spoke of their works as equal to the duration of a season and vastly more importance than that of any other body of color people ever ascended in the United States. They spoke with pride of their heritage from Africa. I repeat this one more time. 
They spoke with pride with their heritage from Africa and looked forward to the time and face of redemption from their semi-bonds of the United, beyond the United States boundary. One simple editor, part of Nevis and a motivating spirit of the movement of immigration and for Negro nationalism, when he wrote, in gallant faith, not without data to rest upon, which prompts the main manly declaration. I believe it to be the destiny of the Negro to develop a higher order of civilization and Christianity than the world has yet seen. When a considerable number of black men come to be a true and sublime faith in such destiny, their life will begin to compel the world to award them with some praise. In final analysis, the National Immigration Convention and the whole immigration movement represent a minority action in 1854. But the minority was strong enough to command wide respect. The established leaders were hard pressed in the middle of the 1850s to keep their fellows interested in remaining in the United States. The old order was fighting a defense action against a newer concept of migration and the establishment of a new nation beyond the boundaries of the United States. So that's how it went down, you know. They say that, you know, that's how it went down, you know, about the Negro nationalism here, you know. Um, we talk about the Negro Migration Convention. Um, I only do the last video on that, on this series, gonna be the guts of it. You know, that's about a good 40, 50 pages, but it tells you what they really wanted. They wanted, you know, land elsewhere. They, the nationalism that we going on now is nowhere near the nationalism back then, where you wanted a nation, they had plans set for, you know what I'm saying? They sell conventions up, they doing things, they connecting with brothers and sisters, you know what I'm saying, in, in, in Africa, all around the world and stuff like that. In Jamaica and the Caribbean, they connecting with places like that, you know what I'm saying? They're building an international green book. And also too, the problem is still the same in the black community too, because most of the so-called business owners, the teachers, the preachers, and all that stuff, so well, we got it good right here. I mean, why should we leave? We got everything good that we need. You know, I'm a leader in the community. The white man says so. You know, I, that's why I got this wonderful title as minister, as banker, as school board president. You understand what I'm trying to say? So they felt it was still like the black community, which it is still, it's still based off a of plantation thinking, a colonization type thing. And the only way to break that colonization type thinking is building a black nation. Well, I'm a Coast Gift Fun Day. Hope you enjoyed this time in history. You know what I'm saying? I, I enjoyed it too and learned a lot. Um, learned about these black hair, you know, people. We're going to go a little bit more back in African nationalism, black nationalism during that time. You know, remember the difference. They had plans, they had step plan, thought through plans. It wasn't just Cat coming up here saying, we want this and we want that. No, we're going to make this happen, this, this, this. And they always kept that connection. They kept that overseas connection. They kept that out of state connection. You know what I'm saying? And that's another thing, you know, people ain't really trying to connect like that no more. People trying to be the group. But every time you know the group in that Negro National, Negro National or whatever you in, it don't make it. You understand me? Also notice too, one more thing before I go, you know what I'm saying? And, um, subscribe to the channel, hit the like button. It was how you know, when he's talking about the Baltimore and stuff like that, how the Negro bourgeoisie there, or the ones that was against migration, violently attacked those that was, that was trying to get up out of here. Like they was traitors to the race or something like that because they wanted to leave the United States. You know, that, that really kind of rubbed me the wrong way. You know what I'm saying? So it kind of added a, a, a kind of a violent type editor to it. But anyway, y'all, much love. Like I said, my name is Coast Get Funded. We're going to keep dropping hits like this. And subscribe to the channel. Peace. What's up, what's up?